How many of you have ever been a part of a choir? When the hands just shot up all over this room. Let's, let's, let's do that again. And that's really what I want to know. I want to I see some hands. Um, how many of you have ever been a part of a choir? It could be a school choir, children's choir, an adult choir. Just lift your hand. All right. A lot of you. I raise my hand there. Well, my goal today is for every hand to be raised at the end. And I want to give you an invitation today to join the choir. That got Caleb's attention, I know. He's thinking, wow, I should have been told ahead of time on that. Psalm 96. Would you open your Bibles today to Psalm 96? This is our second song of the summer in our Songs of Summer series, we picked up this year where we left off last year. And we are in Psalm 96, last week in Psalm 95. And Lord willing, we'll cover six psalms. We'll go through Psalm 100. And Psalm 95 through Psalm 100 teaches us, uh, they teach us about worship. They teach us about who we worship and why we worship. And they teach us about how we worship. Worship. Worship is a response to the greatness of God. Worship is the way that we communicate our love to the Heavenly Father, the Jesus and the Holy Spirit, our triune God. Worship is a response to the greatness of God. How we worship is an indicator of how we view the greatness of God. How we take our personality, how we take our soul, how we take our bodies, our words, our hands, how we worship is an indicator of how we view the greatness of God. In Psalm 95, last week, I spoke to you about what we do in worship. What we do in worship lifted right out of God's Word. Not lifted from tradition, uh, but lifted from God's Word. And Psalm 95 mentions not everything that we do in worship, but at least nine things that we do in worship. We learn in Psalm 95 that we gather in worship. We sing in worship we make joyful noise we express thanksgiving we praise we humble ourselves we hear we remember and ultimately we rest in Christ we trust in him our worship is to lead us to rest in him when I think about those nine things what we do in worship gather sing make joyful noise Thanksgiving, praise, humble ourselves here. Uh, remember, it makes me think a lot about Bible school. I mean, I don't know of a week where there's more joyful noise in a place than vacation Bible school. And we certainly gathered, we certainly sang, we expressed thanksgiving. We listened at times. There was listening uh, during the week of Bible school, moments of time where there was listening. Um, and... Um, it's, it's what we do in worship. It's what we're doing this morning in worship. We're gathering, we're singing, we're making joyful noise, we're expressing thanksgiving, we're praising Him, we're humble ourselves, we hear from Him, which means we listen and we obey, we remember what He's done for us, and ultimately, the hope is that we rest in Christ. It's why we do what we do. When you just uh, last week, someone uh, said to me uh, in the service I mentioned it and then it happened after the service we're about midways back standing here in this room a guy looked at me and he said I did not grow up in church all of this is new to me and so when we look at God's word we can't just assume that we know what to do in worship or why we do what we do in worship and we learned some of that in Psalm 95 this morning we moved to Psalm 96 and I want to pull out one act of worship and speak to you about one thing that we do 
in worship. And I want to I want to preach to you today, I want to talk to you today about singing. I want to speak to you about singing. Psalm 96, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe To the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the the world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And the heavens (laughs) declare... His glory. Amen? All right. We timed that out perfectly, didn't we? I mean, we worked hard this week. Let's get it right where the thunder will be. This week, I've studied singing. I've studied singing. It's a strange thing to study, but it's right here in God's Word. And three times, beginning in Psalm 96... It says, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord. Again, sing to the Lord. In studying singing this week, I've studied God's word. It's also been a study of a lifetime of church involvement. You know, that before I was ever preaching, I was singing. And before I ever became a pastor or answered a call to preach, I would stand on occasion, in front of our church, Mount Hope Baptist Church, about 100 people. Mr. Alan Jeffress was a principal at a local high school, and when he was away, for some reason, he would ask this 12-year-old kid or 13-year-old kid to lead music. And then when he stopped, Mr. Gene White would say, "Uh, Carlos, would you fill in? Would you lead the singing uh, this week? And I learned 4-4 timing as a little kid on how to lead uh, songs and let everybody on the first verse and the second verse and we'll skip the third and go to the fourth. I mean, you know (laughs) how it, I was was trained like a good Baptist. Well, a lot of books and sermons have led to what I understand about singing from writers like Kidner or Wenham, recently reading the work of the Gettys in a little book called Sing listening to words taught by Matt Boswell, who's a professor of worship and uh, of, of worship at Southern Seminary. And all of these will play into what I'll say this morning about singing. Just a moment ago, we sang this song that we've sung for a number of years called 10,000 Reasons. There's a line that repeats itself over and over again in that song. It says, sing like never before. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship your holy name. I want to ask you today, did you sing like you never have before? And would it be possible by the Spirit of God to work in our hearts and lives today that from this moment on we would sing like we never have before? God's word tells us, commands us, God's word commands us more than 50 times 
to sing. Today, when we think about whether or not we're going to sing, it's not a decision about whether or not we sound good. It's not a a decision about whether or not we're too loud or too soft. The decision is whether or not we're going to obey. And God's word commands us more than 50 times, imperative commands, to sing. Just like here in Psalm 96, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord. More than 400 times in scripture, singing is mentioned. More than 400 times. One of the great gifts that God has given to us as followers of Jesus Christ, one of the great gifts he's given to us as a part of the kingdom of God is the gift to be able to sing. Christianity is a singing faith. There are a lot of faiths in the world, a lot of religions that people hold to, and singing is not a part of what they do and how they devote their lives, what God has given to us, this gift of singing. Matt Boswell points out that in God's word, God sings. You know that? God sings. It's some of your favorite, it's, for some of you, it's your favorite verse. In Zephaniah 3, 17, listen to that verse. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That's God. God sings. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus sings. At the Last Supper, they sang a hymn together and went out. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul twice commands us to sing. In Ephesians and Colossians both, we're instructed to sing. And then we read in Revelation that for eternity, one of the things that we'll be doing is singing. It's not the only thing. It's not everything that we will do. As I, I heard a story one time where a person was kind of hesitating about going to heaven and they said if it just means that we're going to sing 24-7 the rest of eternity I'm not sure that's me it's not the only thing we're going to do but one of the things that we will do in eternity is singing and I would think that in many ways what we do here in some way some form or fashion is like rehearsal it's like choir rehearsal for an eternal song that we will lift in heaven what is singing? What is singing? Boswell points out that maybe the best definition of singing comes from that great philosopher, Buddy the Elf. You know him? Buddy the Elf in this movie said, Singing is just like talking, except it's louder and longer, and you move your voice up and down. <laughs> and that's what singing is. Singing, as I said last week, takes the thoughts of our mind and the words of our mouth and the beliefs of our heart and puts them into a memorable melody. What is singing? Well, I want to talk to you here for a few minutes about wholehearted biblical singing with background music we'll talk about singing number one singing singing is to bless his name singing is to bless his name I won't labor each of these points I just want to highlight in scripture what singing is verse two uh, he says sing to the Lord bless his name name that means to lift up his name to give goodness to his name Uh, it it teaches us that our wholehearted biblical singing has an audience and the audience of our singing is God himself today when we gathered in this room the audience for those on this stage the audience for us gathered in this room is is the Lord His name is the focus of our singing. His fame is an easy way for you to remember it. In our singing, His fame is the aim. His fame is the aim. Wholehearted biblical singing is to bless His name. 
Number two, singing is to tell of his salvation. Singing is to tell of his salvation. Verse two, sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. When you think about the words to our songs, the declaring in our songs, what we put in melody, part of singing, wholehearted biblical singing is to, is to tell the gospel, is to sing the good news of Jesus Christ, is to sing the work of God in rescuing, in redeeming. I have to admit that when I learned uh, the words that God is a rescuing God and that God is a redeeming God, I don't remember the particular verses of Scripture where I learned that first. But I do remember the particular songs where I learned that first. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. And you can carry that song on out from there. Or redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Those songs that we, we sing. I, I think of a song by Mercy Me. That is one of my favorite all-time songs. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Our biblical singing, our singing is to bless his name. Our singing is to tell of his salvation. Things like that God rescues and that God redeems. I can hardly not mention the song at Calvary that declares the salvation of God. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary. At Calvary. There's a story back in the history of our church of a young lady who was attending our services. She was raised Hindu. I won't mention her name because I don't have permission to mention her name, but some of you would know her story. And we were worshiping in the, what we call the life building. And we, was, we began to sing a song about the majesty of God. And we learned later that day that this college-age girl who had been uh, attending our church trusted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior right in the middle of the congregation singing that song about God's majesty. In our singing, we're to tell of his salvation. Number three, wholehearted biblical singing. Singing is to declare his glory our singing is to declare his glory verse 3 declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised he is to be feared above all gods for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols but the Lord made the heaven. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. What you have after verse 3 of, that instructs us to declare his glory are all the different things that come together to create his glory. The, the word glory, uh, it's uh, sometimes hard to get a grasp on what that word means. But I like to understand glory when it relates to God is all of his attributes all rolled together in one. And what makes him glorious are all the attributes of who he is. In these verses, we learn of at least ten different attributes of God. Ten different reasons to give him glory. It gives us a lot of singing material. A lot of our songs contain these very things. L listen to these. It's just lifted right out of Psalm 96. When we sing to declare his glory... We are declaring his marvelous works. We are declaring his greatness. We're declaring his worthiness. It says in verse, um, verse 4, For great is the Lord, his greatness, and greatly to be praised. That declares his worthiness. And then we see here his awesomeness. He says, For all... For, for he is to be feared above all gods. He's to be feared above all gods. His marvelous works, his greatness, his worthiness, his awesomeness, and then even his preeminence. 
I mentioned his preeminence because here in these verses, it, it speaks of God being the one who created it all. He's the creator of all things. When he speaks of idols here, he says, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. You realize that the idols that the world worships are things that have been created by man. And God, when we worship him, is the one who has created all things, even man, even humanity. We declare his marvelous works. We declare his greatness. We declare his worthiness. We declare his awesomeness. We declare his preeminence. And then there are four things grouped together here, four attributes. We declare his splendor. We declare his majesty. We declare his strength. We declare his beauty. And then verse 9, you see, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. We declare his holiness. So what do we sing about? We sing to bless his name. We sing to tell of his salvation. We sing to declare his glory. He's worthy of our song. Number four, we, our wholehearted biblical singing disciples hearts. Have you noticed how singing disciples a heart? And it is not just uh, Christian faith. A lot of things that people believe today in the world come from the very songs we sing. One leader of nations in the past uh, said, you give, me, uh, you give me your songs and they'll write the laws. Uh, singing disciples' hearts. I want you to see this. In verse 1, he says, Oh, sing to the Lord. And then notice that next phrase, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, new songs are not the only thing that we're to sing. We can't stand before you today and say every song we sing ought to be a new song, but we are instructed in God's word to make a practice of singing new songs to the Lord. Back in, chapter, in Psalm 95, we're just instructed to sing. And recorded in God's word, you have 150 songs. And from where we sit today, we would say 150 old songs. Really old songs. I mean, like, older than Just As I Am. And, and older than Rescue the Perishing. And older than what we might be thinking when we think about the Baptist hymnal of 1975. Or the Red Book hymnal or the uh, Broadman hymnal. These are old songs. But there was a day, imagine this, there was a day when Psalm 96 was a new song. Do you know that? There was a day when Psalm 96 was a new song. And, and I, I wonder if when it was first introduced into their, their temple worship, if somebody in the crowd said, he did it again, he's singing one of those new songs. We're singing one of those new songs. But the instruction, why would we sing a new song and why would we sing an old song? I think there are, there are two, at least two really encouraging reasons. Number one, uh, you sing a new song because it marks his current work. We sing a new song because a new song marks his current work. Those who study revival, when they look back through history and they begin to look at moments in time where many people came to know Christ, there was a great widespread movements of, of people coming to know Christ. What you will find again and again and again in the middle of many people coming to know Christ, you, you know what you find? New music, new songs, new melodies. Uh, so, so many of the songs that you began to sing in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s around campfires at youth camps were songs that were birthed during the Jesus movement. Songs like Keith Green wrote. Songs that were born right in the middle of God doing a new work. And new songs mark new works of God. Well, what do old songs do? Old songs 
do not mark his current work. Old songs that we have in our heart that we sung before remind us of his past work. And those songs that were new in those moments of God working in our heart, when we sing them again as old songs, it does something that we need in our life. They become a remembrance. They become a song that takes us back to a point in time that leaves us saying, God is faithful. God is faithful. When I pastored in Cleveland, Tennessee at Macedonia Baptist Church, the room was a single aisle room it would seat about 150 people about about 75 people on each side of the room and that room that would hold about 150 people um, we we would occasionally fill it up but on one particular occasion we had this event we called youth jam and it started on a Sunday night, and we were going to go uh, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. And, and we had preaching, and we had singing, and we invited teenagers all over our community. Well, the first night, to sort of get the word, we did that old thing of, I don't think you can do it anymore. We called it kidnapping kids. Y'all remember that? We had, like, we had like 20 kids in our youth group and we put them in parents' cars and they went to the houses of all their friends and they said, come on, come on, go to church. And they brought back their friends on that first night. And, and, and I don't, my, my memory is something like 60 or 70 kids wound up coming on that Sunday night. And then we were in the schools on Monday telling kids and we were giving free pizza and all, I mean, just all the things and and, and, and that night, there were about twice that many. And then on Wednesday, by Wednesday night, in that room that was to hold 150 people, there were over 300 teenagers that had packed into that room. That old church building had a basement underneath it. And I'm pretty sure just wooden joists between it and the bottom floor. And it's a miracle today that that room did not fall through. A man by the name of Joel Goddard, who leads worship, at Bethlehem Church now, back when he had hair and no beard. Uh, so y'all can tell him I said it. But he showed up, and some friend of mine said, contact Joel Goddard. He uh, goes to Shorter College, and he's a pig farmer, and he plays guitar, and get him to come lead worship. And he came up and met Joel for the first time, and he started singing one of those new songs. Never heard it before. And we sang it the first night. And then we sang it the second night. And then we sang it the third night. And we got to Tuesday night, and God was moving so big, we just said, let's go another night. And, and some man stepped up, and he said, I'll pay for all the food tomorrow night. We came back another night, and then another night. We just kept extending it. You know what that new song was that we sang? Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Shout to the Lord. Y'all remember that new song that's now 30 years old? Every time I hear that song, it's not a new song anymore. You know what that song is? It's an old song. But you know what it does every time I hear it? It takes me back to that moment where God moved in power, where more than 80 teenagers trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that week. New songs mark the moment of God's activity. Old songs remind us of God's past work, telling us about his faithfulness. That's what we do in singing. That's why we sing new songs. That's why we sing old songs. Songs disciple our hearts. Fifth, singing, evangel singing evangelizes the nations. As you read through this psalm, you begin to see the word nations brought up. In verse 3, it says, declare his glory among the nations. Verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And Psalm 96 is one of many psalms from Psalm 2 all the way to Psalm 150. You have this theme of 
the God of Israel becoming the God of all nations. And, it, and you just you can travel with it throughout Psalms. And here in Psalm 96, you see uh, how our singing and the declaring of his fame and the declaring of, of his salvation in our song becomes a piece of God reaching the nations, declaring that he reigns, declaring that he saves, declaring that he's the God that is worthy. Music here has been a part of the motivation to move us out to the nations. When we sing songs like Send the Light or Go Tell It on the Mountain or newer songs about reaching the nations, they carry the theme of Psalms, of God's salvation going to the nations. This morning I want to take a minute and I want you to watch an update about the very practical nature of how the gospel has gone to the nations 